Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am so thrilled to have you here today joining us for the 2021 Pong Neurodiverse Internship Showcase event. We're so excited to share with you today the work that our interns have accomplished over the past eight weeks in this paid summer internship experience at the Power of Neuro Gaming Center at the Qualcomm Institute here at UC San Diego. But I first want to start by setting the stage just a bit because we are at a really great intersection right now and I think is exciting and we want to make sure that we highlight this opportunity. You may have heard the phrase that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. This is unfortunately very true in multiple industries, including technical work. And as our society starts to awaken to these dramatic benefits that diverse teams bring in creativity, in terms of problem solving, we would be really foolish to ignore neurodiverse talent in planning for the future of work. We need programs and events like this because the more neurodiverse workplaces we have, the more creative solutions we will have and the, the, the more happier, energized work environments we will enjoy. But changing the status quo isn't gonna happen through singular efforts and it's not gonna happen without some serious nudging. <laughs> so that is why we and our partners here are focusing on creating a community of practice around supporting more diverse, inclusive, and creative future of work. We're hosting this internship program as part of the National Science Foundation Future of Work program. They have funded this effort as well as research, um, related research here at UC San Diego. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled to present this to you together with my co-PI, Pamela Cosman. Pam is a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at UCSD, and she's leading up the development of some really exciting supportive tech tools for this project along with her colleague, Professor Suja Day, and some really talented graduate students. Um, Professor Shauna Cohen and her colleague, Professor uh, Sasha Zadek, um, are, are um, education professors that provided professional development through lunch and learn workshops and researching the support that interns um, have enjoyed in their family and community to get them to this point, but also looking at uh, gaps of how we can support them more effectively. Professor Craig Callender is leading the study of ethical considerations surrounding various hiring practices that affect neurodivergent job seekers. So our internship program is really focused on tech development in terms of developing skills, but we're, we're really all about video games because as hopefully you all know, video games are awesome. Um, our interns certainly know that and that's why they found us and this opportunity. But the skills that they're developing in the internship are transferable to many, many different opportunities. So our internship takes a team-based approach to making these research-based video games the groups are working in teams of five and they're using industry standard practices. They're using tools like Unity, they're using Discord to connect, they're using Zoom, they're um, developing their presentations to make to their clients um, who have set out the goals of each project and more on that later. The teams each include a project manager, a designer, an artist, a quality assurance tester and a programmer, but importantly, they really do work together as a team and are supported by a coach so that they help each other when it's needed so that we, we get the job done together. Due to the pandemic, our teams worked remotely, and I'm thrilled to tell you that our interns absolutely thrived in this remote work environment um, using these standard tools for collaboration, and they are ready for the next thing. Um, we had an a unique uh, opportunity. This is our second remote internship as part of the NSF funded Future of Work. We did have an opportunity to have an in-person summer internship program in 2018, but this year we have an extra special opportunity. Um, our program is supported by some folks, uh, wonderful people from Ubisoft, one of the largest game um, developing groups, uh, game developers in the world. And so I'd like to introduce now Pierre Esketch and Eris Bricker. Pierre is at Massive, a studio, a Ubisoft studio um, in Sweden and has organized a neurodiverse employee resource, resource group across Ubisoft. And I'll let him tell you about that and also introduce Eris 
who has um, been a mentor for our interns, one of five mentors who have supported our interns throughout this summer. Okay, and now I'd like, um, Pierre, if you would um, say, uh, unmute yourself and say a few words, that would be fantastic. Hello, everyone. Uh, here I am. Hey, uh, thank you, Liam. Uh, very pleased to be with you today. I'm talking to you from uh, Scandinavia. Uh, technically not Sweden, but uh, Denmark, uh, which is very nearby. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction and, and I'm really happy uh, to be with you today. So a, a few words about us. In fact, uh, uh, a few months ago within Ubisoft, uh, uh, a few of us decided to launch a, a group on neurodiversity. Um, and uh, as of today, we are more than 130 people across uh, 14 different countries within Ubisoft uh, to have uh, 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 who came together uh, to push the topic of neurodiversity. Why? Because in fact, we have uh, two passion and I think we share the same. The first one is about game and video game. We love video game. We develop video game uh, uh, and we like to play. And we do really believe that video game uh, can help people getting together. And that through video game, you can do many things, not only have fun, but also learn, experiment, exercise, uh, and discover more about yourself and about the world. And we are a strong believer of that. And to make those games, you know that you need to be creative. And one of the booster of creativity we know is, is the capacity to gather in the same place, people with different brains and different way of thinking. So our second passion is neurodiversity because many of us, we are neurodivergent. Whether some of us are on the spectrum, ADHD, or have a learning disorder or other, other condition, this is a reality which is shared by many of our coworker and our uh, ambition is to uh, put them together and try to advocate for neurodiversity, but also for a strong connection between neurodiversity and video games. And that's how we discovered Pong a few months ago also, uh, because uh, what you've been doing with Pong is exactly what we're looking for. It's the intersection between video game, uh, neurodiversity, neuroscience, um, and uh, we have discovered the Pong Center. We took contact with Leanne and the crew at Pong Center. We had a great connection. And for us, it was very obvious uh, and it was making lots of sense uh, to propose you a small contribution by bringing in some mentor. So saying that, um, let me introduce you to Harris, who was one of the active member working with all of you. Hello, it's good to meet everyone. I am Eris. I am a game designer with Ubisoft Red Storm in North Carolina, one of the mentors for the program. Um, so I also had a background in user experience and studying and eventually teaching at Northeastern University where Leanne is working now, or soon, <laughs> yeah. Um, so as part of the mentorship program, I we were, every mentor had a different specialty that they could bring to it. So I'm sure that every group had a slightly different experience. Uh, the things that we were looking to do were to just introduce the students to how the methodologies of a larger studio might work. Um, personally, I also brought in like some uh, perspectives of some of the smaller studios, but we were looking at making out scheduling, talking about different communication patterns um, and looking at making your working on scope, minimum viable product, a lot of like client relationships. We went over lots of people's different types of roles that they could have in the game industry and then even on their small team. This week, my team did a postmort. So we went back on the whole process of the internship, but then a lot of their actual design process itself, instead of investigating the game, we looked at how did your process work for your teamwork, your scheduling, um, all of those things to, so that they could then reflect and bring this back to their projects in the future. Uh, we went over to some stuff to put on portfolio. So we tried to do a full, like going right from early stages and ideation of game design all the way out to, and now you have to ship this thing and give it to your client and then also show people the work that you did. And we talked about getting jobs in the industry. As a neurodivergent person myself, 
um, this was really fun for me to do and to be able to connect with some students and with people that are all over um, remotely has been pretty cool for that. And like we get to do these sort of things that wouldn't necessarily happen otherwise. I find that this is a mutually beneficial uh, project that we're doing. It, it, yeah, we're helping the students and like exchanging a lot of information, but it also is helping me think critically about my role and my processes and the things that I'm doing here. And are these processes themselves actually friendly for the other neurodivergent people that are at the studio now and who will be coming in? It also helps to prepare me to know like what sort of people will be entering the workforce next and who my future colleagues will be. So overall, I think it was a really awesome experience uh, both ways and looking forward to doing it again in the future. Thank you so much, Eris, and thank you, Pierre. These are exactly the kind of partners that we have been so fortunate to work with. This is this is what we need. We need this community. We need visionary companies to realize that this is the talent that we need for the future of work. And so because we spent so much time in our excitement getting uh, introduced to what we're doing, we ought to move on to our very first group. So our first group is uh, led by a coach, Nathan Miner, who actually hails from Northeastern. He's part of the game science and design program there, where as Eris mentioned, I am uh, going in the fall. Don't worry, San Diego, I'll still see you. You can't get rid of me yet. Um, but this particular project is being hosted as a client by Professor Pam Cosman, the co-PI of this project, and they are working on network communication. I will let the team um, introduce itself and you guys take it from here. Yeah? Great, hi, thank you. And happy to be introducing the game. Uh, it's titled ACNAC, and we'll get right into it. So I'm Nate Miner, and it's been my pleasure to serve as the coach for this team, and it's an honor to introduce them. Uh, Tyler Garafa worked as the team's designer. Duye Lu as the artist. Uh, David Freider as the project manager, and Chris Welter, the programmer, and Nathan Hunter as the tester. So eight weeks ago, these people came together for the first time, and they dove right into the work of learning all the new tools and processes of game development. For many of them, it was their first time to work in this, uh, in the role of a designer or as an artist in the context of game design. And it's been an inspiration to see them negotiate the creative process from the initial brainstorming of this board um, to the prototype they're gonna share with you now. Uh, I think their journey has been a model of creative collaboration and I'm proud to introduce, have them introduce the game. So team, take it away. David, you're muted. My apologies. The idea behind this game is to simulate a communication network in which uh, the nodes are uh, passed from one end of the, the of the network to another. We uh, we made this game with the intention to entice young people um, and children into the STEM fields particularly young women between the ages of eight and 13. Wait, before we get to that, um, Nathan Hunter is not on the panel right now. Yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So as you guys see here, here is a little bit of a gameplay um, workflow of what we're actually doing. Um, I'll let it reset for you guys so I can actually explain. So the gameplay here is starting out with moving the player moving individual packets on the right, as you see with the little mouse right there. These, these little packets will actually move down the map in an optimized way, or I guess algorithmically logical pathway. And um, at the end, they'll be received on the far right end. So going to the next slide, I'll go over the actual mechanics themselves. 
So the very in our image here on the right, I'll go over some basic components. We have our source nodes, which are actually used to produce the little packets that we actually send down the network. The player will be having to physically pick up those objects and then drop them off at the first set of nodes here on the right. They will transverse down the wires using, as I said before, algorithmically optimized routes. Um, at each intermittent buffer or intermittent node, there will be different amounts of buffer capacity as well as different delay times. And this accounts for the fact that in a wireless network, um, packets don't just zip from point A to point B. Sometimes they actually take some time to actually get from the server to your location. And at the very end, it says that the packets are collected at the destination nodes, or in most cases, it'd be sort of like your phone or your cell or your laptop. And after you've completed the level, it'll produce the next scene, which we'll be cutting to now. So in our game, we used Blender to create 3D assets like source nodes and packets we also implement, implemented some 3D assets found on the internet. In addition, we used Photoshop to create introduction page, scenes and characters. So this is our dialogue system and visual novel. Um, we used a uh, asset called Fungus that helped kind of create and assemble this scene. Um, it pretty much helped avoid uh, writing new scripts for uh, how the text appears and how the characters move around. It was a way to help shorten the coding side of it and more focus on what the scene needs to do and how to assemble the scene in Unity. And now we are moving on to the challenges of the project. To start, we had some art challenges, which include deciding on a consistent style and theme, just making all the ideas work together. And we have choosing the right sprites and the right assets for that style and theme. And then we had to find an appealing theme for a target audience that would be consistent fitting. And then for our story, we just had to figure out a storyline, just make it to make it fun and still relevant to communication networks. All right. And then going over sort of the programming challenges. One of the big ones here was that most of my team had to learn about Unity. I am still new to it and I had to learn a lot. And I have to say, thank you guys for working so hard on this. Um, going over some of the actual technical issues we started out with is what I call the cloning issue. We actually were able to use a thing called instantiate. It's a function found within Unity that allows the game to actually reproduce objects as we need them. And another thing that we had to do was actually learn how to research and navigate what's called the Unity asset store. And that's how we were able to find a thing called node maps, which allowed us to not only make a map, but then also find um, a map that has optimized scripts to help utilize the asset itself. So we were able to make it so that objects can go from point A to point B to point C to point D, which is our final destination, which is thankfully what we have for node map. Now, as far as future development goes, we are still responsible. There's still the responsibility to be fulfilled as far as setting up the event score and object managers and integrating reliability mechanics to the network, such as allowing Dr. Error to sabotage or to pick a short unreliable path or a long reliable path.
In addition, uh, we plan to build more levels and make smoother scene transitions by having a more coherent storyline. This includes creating a tutorial level in which the player is sending a text message. We also want to add animations and other types of player feedback to make the game more interactive and interesting. We thought maybe making things like highlighting notes when a player hovers over them with a packet or making a notification sound when the packet is receiving by its destination. We'd like to express our deepest thanks to our client, Dr. Pamela Cosman, our Ubisoft mentor, Robin Moore, uh, our Pong project developer, uh, Khalil Jackson, and the Pong staff itself, um, and Gilead Cosman. And we'd like to thank Every, uh, everybody at Pong who gave us this opportunity, who, uh, who worked hard to facilitate everything that happened here. And uh, we look, and uh, we, we very much appreciate what you've given us. At this point, we will be taking your questions and comments. Nicely done, team. And, and we thank you for your hard work. This is a really great start to our program today. Cool game that's, that's seeking to teach um, kids or whomever wants to learn about network communication. So this QR code here will take you to what's called an itch.io site where you can actually play this game. Um, this is a good point for me to tell you that, and I'll put this in chat for everyone um, to see. Actually, maybe it needs to go into messaging, I'll check. But I'll show this at the end that there's a website for all of our interns where they have their LinkedIn profile where you could learn more about the, the project that they, they worked on. But first, now that we just had this great presentation, um, does the community have any questions? We're getting lots of applause. Great job team from your client. Dr. Co Professor Cosman, woohoo. Any questions? Okay, we got, so Ara has a question. Do you guys have any inspirations for the narrative that the team created? It looks interesting and fun. Who wants to take that one? I can take that. Okay, um, go ahead, David. So the narrative behind the game was mostly started by brainstorming. Uh, we didn't really draw from any one particular inspiration. We just kind of tossed around ideas until we figured out what stick, what, 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 what stuck. Um, uh, we, we eventually, we initially started out with silly ideas like uh, a villain who wanted to break into a secure facility to paint puppies pink. And then um, uh, like a, um, we decided that that, uh, that that probably would be a little bit too silly and irrelevant. So we moved on to uh, something uh, more like the bad guy is um, is the head of some kind of big ISP, and he wants to sabotage his um, his competitors uh, because he feels like he can't get ahead in the competition. And uh, and our, our main character is a young is a young girl who's assisted by a little robot dog. We kind of figured a robot dog would be cute and friendly and appealing to young women. That's about that's kind of how our narrative went. Nicely done. Cool. An, an original idea, right? I also wanted to call out the fact that this team deserves super props, some shout outs, because they had not just standard remote work challenges, but serious time zone issues. So Nathan Miner, coach, is in Massachusetts um, as, a, as a, a master's student at Northeastern. Um, we've got several people, Chris, David Frieder, uh, Tyler, Nathan, all in San Diego, or at least the Pacific time zone. And Duye is in China. <laughs> and they made it work, right? Way to go, team. Um, OK, so uh, Sherry is ask, asking a question. Sherry is actually particularly interested in the work you guys have done here as a, as a researcher herself. She likes the app. And she asks, can you remind me what is the intended age range for players? Is it designed for all ages? Um, I can go over that one. Um, it is targeted for the eight to 13 year olds in terms of simplicity, but it can be for all age groups. It's um, very much a sort mechanism. So people much younger can enjoy it or people that are really old and want to learn like, how does my email get sent and it's like you're 
your your grandparents, for example, could pick this up and be like, oh, that's how my wireless network you set up for me last year works. Like it can be for any range, but we were targeting a little bit more towards a younger audience with the colors and stuff. But in the future, we can definitely add it for adding levels that will be more complex for more of the adult range if you wish that too. Nathan, would you like to add something? Yeah, the, the levels could progress throughout. So it could start at a, you know, a very simple level tutorial level that could be, you know, used and played for younger ages. It, and then when you can continue on to the harder levels, you know, you can, it could be more for older people and people that want to learn more about networking. Those levels can be implemented and that's what they can learn from and play with too, if they already know their basics. So it's kind of like a nice like level up from each uh, level and it can teach them new things in each level. Fantastic. Um, I'm excited to play this through. I've only got to play a little bit of all of these, but uh, that is my reward tonight for getting through to Friday. So um, I hope you all play too. I'm going to drop the um, uh, thank you team. First of all, another round of applause for our first team um, with, with this cool uh, network communication game. And we're like the next team to queue up. Um, but you will see in the chat, I just dropped in the internship website for this year where you could actually learn a little bit more about all the teams and their games. Okay, without further ado, our next group is a mobility hub group with the coach, Ara Young, and she is a Pong staff member um, who's actually coming with me to Northeastern. So we are spreading the love. We're gonna continue this good work here in San Diego and move it also to Boston. Um, so, so you'll learn more about that plan at the end. So the Mobility Hub, the client here is Sandag, specifically Daniel Kochman with assistance from Marisa Mangan and Ava Gabriel. So really excited to share what this team developed. And so go ahead, Mobility Hub team, take it away from here. All right, cool. So uh, hello again. My name is Ara. I am the coach for Mobility Hub. And before I hand it off to the team, I just want to quickly say congratulations and thank you to the team for the amazing work that they put into the project. And um, I saw them collaborate together. I saw them grow and learn throughout the individual struggles that they faced. And I also saw them improve on the talents that they came with um, when they first joined. And so I'm very excited for um, every single one of them. And I know that they'll succeed in their own paths. Yeah, so then without further ado, I'll go ahead and open up the stage uh, to the Team Mobility Hub so that they can share their experiences. Okay, give it one moment. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Josh. I am the project manager for Mobility Hub. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and have everyone just introduce themselves, starting with our artist, Wilson. Hello. And then our uh, designer, Colin. Hello everyone. Our tester, Nicholas. Hello. And then our programmer, Ryan. Hello. All right. Then moving forward, um, Mobility Hub is a simulation game that we created for Sandag. Um, it used, uh, it's a metropolitan, uh, metropolitan planning organization in the San Diego County government, and they were our clients. Now, simulation games, they attempt to copy various activities in forms of real life experience, very similar to like, a, like being in a slice of life. And it, they do it in order to make the player feel like they're living a real CD experience in a simulated environment. So the goal of the game is to do various different tasks while reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions as, they, as, pos as much as possible being polluted in the San Diego city of North Park. 
And I'm going to go ahead and let our programmer, Ryan, um, let, let us uh, know how his experience was. OK, my name is Ryan. I was a programmer for this project. Like my work, my work like, tend to involve of creating in the gameplay, hey, setting up, up a virtual world for the project, but creating builds for my teammates to test, and implementing in designs and assets given to me by my teammates. I have to say, hey, one of my hardest challenges is, was is implementing a, a, na a nav match obstacle component into a, a procedurally generated environment provided by and the Google Maps a API assets we use. I had to figure, I had to research and figure out how, how to code that in. And and here's below OS P is part of the code that was used to do so. <clears throat> now, oh, I I learned some um interesting. Yeah, I learned some new things from on this uh, from the this program. I learned how to manage my my tasks using Injira, the agile uh, project development app uh, that we've been using. I also learned some um, new skills those with Unity and C Sharp, and I gained some more experience in GitHub. Uh, another skill I I learned. And during this internship was learning to set up a balance between my work life and my personal life. That can be useful. Oh, oh, for our, our, our career. Now, oh, oh, I, now I, uh, I'll let uh, Wilson take it from here. Hello, everyone. Um, Wilson Bo is my name. And as the artist of Mobility Hub, I was in charge of the visuals for our game. And in particular, we had, um, there was quite a lot that I learned from having this role. Like, I never expected being an artist would have some, like, hurdles to go over. And the first, and probably one of the hardest, was our market research and to specify on what that is we had to try and figure out what we wanted the art style for the game to look like and market research is looking at other games that were of a similar genre or play style so looking into that on the side are the two pictures which are sim city and roller coaster tycoon which instead of making a city or an amusement park our goal was to try making like one person in an in a pre-existing city and after looking through those two games we figured that a more minimalist style worked well in our favor for both being more accessible visually speaking for uh e for everybody kind of audience and after having decided on that art style i had a lot in the way of like creating and finding assets that would work well for our goal in the game's looks. So first off, I had found the models, which is like the shapes of 3D objects. And after finding them, there was also implementing and finding textures, which are like the images that bring the colors to the 3D objects. and there was a lot of work put towards not only like trying to put them together uh, myself, but also going to my team asking for feedback, which is very much a new experience for me as someone who formerly pretty much worked alone most of the time. And another aspect of like the visuals of the game that I didn't take into account, if you could click real quick would be the icons and the user interface, which are like the text boxes, the colors, and how buttons would be displayed for the player. Since there's an emphasis both on trying to give all the information while still being like clear and easy to see for people to understand. <clears throat> and I think 
having done a lot of this, the person that I worked with the most would have to be our designer, which is Colin. And I'd like to give the floor to him now. Oops. Okay. Hi, my name is Colin Caulfield. I was the designer for Mobility Hub. My position for Mobility Hub was to come up with the creative ideas and content for our game. Such responsibilities I had included um, structuring and building a document containing all the game's design, implementing the concept of daily tasks, developing a points and reward system, and searching for music and sound effects that fits the game's theme. As you can see on the left, this is like the, um, the header for our uh, game design document and everything that's in the game. And on the, on the right, that's our um, time range sheet. Like, as you can see, we have uh, some of our game's tasks and the various different things um, that you do or could happen during the task. So yeah, it's all in there. And next, one of the difficulties I faced during this internship was listening to different points of views from my co-developers and having to come to a compromise on ideas so we could do everything we could to make this project great. So like there was one time where me and Wilson were um, consulting about music and sound effects. And, you know, uh, I thought I thought some music and sound effects were um, would fit the game's theme better and he thought some music and sound effects would fit, fit the game's theme better but we um we had slight differences but eventually we came to conclusion and made it work as well as i gained new experience on working together with developers of different skill sets and improved on communicating with a client so yeah basically having to consult with um all the other um developers um with unique things that they brought to this project. It was definitely new, but it definitely um, made me a better developer myself and will make me better in the workforce, as well as I felt like I did a great job on building rapport with our stakeholder. Well, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to our tester, Nick. Hello, I worked on Mobility Hub as a software tester. During my time in this program, I tested the builds and new features implemented in the game. As you can see in the image below, those are some of the builds and features. I used exploratory testing and testing the functionality of our game while, pick, while picking up new skills, such as learning how to use GitHub in Jira in a team-based environment and I believe my experience will help me improve at my job and maintain my next job. The main difficulty I faced was family issues that pulled my attention away from work but it helped me better understand how to maintain a balance between my work and personal matters and it helped with communication. I communicated with my coach about workplace expectations and responsibilities, and I now have a, be a better understanding. I also improved my communication between my team, assisting them with creating pull requests or walking them through technical problems, and it helped me improve being professional and learning how to work as a team and communicating with everyone well. I am now gonna give the floor to Josh, our manager, project manager. Thank you, Nicholas. All right, as he said, I am the project manager. My name is Josh Vu. Um, this is actually my second time at, um, at Pong and this time around I am the project manager and my position at Mobility Hub consisted of delegating tasks uh, between each of the team members and just making sure that they are being active and productive throughout each sprint. Um, I was setting realistic goals and time estimates between each of the individual team members to see their capacity 
of how they'll execute tasks in order to progressively move the project forward. And on top of that, I was using um, software such as Jira and GitHub to help assist my team members and see if they had any questions, just because that's something that I had um, experience in previously. Now, one of the uh, main challenges that I was faced with was coordinating with an interdisciplinary team, um, meaning that we just came from many different types of backgrounds. And because of that, we had different levels of communication. And that actually really stunted our project's growth and progression. Um, I was using different verbiage that I was, I might be telling some of my team members. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to convey what uh, I wanted to be done or what was expected or needed for the team. And because of that, um, things weren't accurately uh, received. Now I overcame this challenge by actively listening to my teammates' concerns and needs, and that allowed me to better explain to them um, what was required from them. Some things I took away was strengthening, strengthening my GitHub and version control skills, which was something I said earlier that experience in. I just found out, or I kind of realized that just because I've had experience with it doesn't mean I'm a master. And it really pushed me to the limit um, this time around. And I felt like I really strengthened uh, the in core experiences. And on top of that, improving communication with working with a team and just being able to have um, a hat and everything. So whenever someone was stuck, I would go in and help. Um, even though I was a project manager, I also helped program and I was able to, to do all of it. All right. So our project, the prototype, has, we have some plans for the future. Um, we wanted to elicit emotions based on the different levels of greenhouse gas emissions in the setting. So the higher levels of greenhouse gas, you'll get a more intense, moody, darker feeling in terms of the music. And as the greenhouse gases low, uh, get lower and cleaner and there's cleaner air, there's a more light, cheery and brighter sky in the setting. Uh, on top of that, we also want to implement accidental events. So these would be just random events that would happen um, whenever we were on different modes of transportation or something that would affect the weather and engage the player into a, a very real life scenario. And it just, it, we found it, the level of randomness would create a very engaging experience. I also want to thank everyone that worked on Mobility Hub from Ryan, Wilson, Colin, Nicholas, and of course our coach, Ara. Thank you for such a great, uh, great eight weeks. And I want to go ahead and bring this um, to the floor and see if everyone had any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, team. This is wonderful. I, I've dropped in chat one more time the internship link that shows you all of the, the groups, but focus right now on, on this group in particular. That's a Mobility Hub. And again, sponsored by our local San Diego client, Sandag. This is fantastic. This is exactly what we're looking to do to engage the community to promote more diverse um, internship opportunities and hiring practices. And the honesty of this group, right, telling you, you know, not only did they get the job done, they, they produced a fantastic product, right, that is this wonderful MVP, um, you know, um, minimal viable product, ready to go, ready for the next step, but they're telling you how they grew, you know, what they learned, what they learned in working together, fantastic. So um, we have a question for you. Gloria Caulfield is asking, who is the intended target for this game? What is the audience for this game? Someone want to take that? Yeah, I could take that. So um, our intended target um, audience for this game was actually, um, at first it was for children, but over time we wanted to just let this be for everyone just because um, living in a time of 
global warming, we want everyone to be aware of how we can change the world in that sense. Awesome. I can see both sides. I can see wanting to educate kids, but also people who have, you know, agency and purchasing and mobility choices right now. Yeah, you want to really reach them. I can see both, both, both ways. Wonderful. Okay, any other questions from the audience for this team? This is fantastic work. Okay, I hope everyone goes to the website and so that they can play this game. Well done team. Okay, thank you very much. I would next like to introduce the next team. Um, this is a team that's focused on, uh, they made a game called Fruits of Labor. Great name, because the game is about candidate assessment. The, the client for this is a longtime colleague who I'm delighted is still working with me after all of this time, Mike Roberts, who um, runs the uh, uh, creating coding careers nonprofit here in San Diego. We are so well aligned and I'm thrilled that he's been a partner and he too is growing in this space. So creating careers for coders is about creating opportunities through apprenticeship programs for adding uh, diverse uh, workers in the tech space. So um, we've actually hired people out of his programs and he has taken some of our people and this is a wonderful addition to the community. And what he wants to see is a tool, a game tool that can um, help identify the superpowers of his applicants, right? What are they really good at? Instead of creating games as a filter to, to you know, sift through applicants, how can we say, you know what, you're really good at this. And so that was what this team was challenged with. The coach for this team is Khalil Jackson, who is a programmer at Pong. And I invite you team to take it away. All right. Hello everyone, ha um, good almost afternoon. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, like Leanne said, my name is Khalil Jackson. I work with the Pong Center and I'm actually here right now. It's a little cold, but I'll make do. Um, and like she said, we were tasked with making a candidate assessment so we could better find a more interactive and fun way to know, you know, if uh, clients are, uh, you know, ready to uh, work with us or like at least assess, you know, what they can do and what they excel at. Um, this is my second year being a coach with the um, Pong Center and doing this internship. And, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, these guys did, they did an amazing job. I was really surprised with like all their individual skills. Um, I would task them with things and then they would, you know, they would go off on their own and they'd be able to do a lot. Um, so and I, was really, I was really surprised at all their individual skill, what they're able to uh, do on their own um, without even having me oversee them. But uh, yeah, you know, without further ado, um, yeah, I'll uh, let them take it away. Thank you, Galil. Um, we made Fruits of, Labor, uh, Fruits of Labor for Mike Roberts as a game that would help identify my desirable traits within candidates. Candidates. Um, the game is smoothie themed, themed, and the enemies enemies within are all are smoothie ingredients, with the exception of the coffee zombie. Zombie. Um, the the game is a puzzle and a, and a bit of a shooter, and the player must make it through puzzles in order to to, to progress for, forwards, collecting acting ingredients in order to build smoothies for 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 to get further on their levels. Levels. The player here needs to get through five levels. Levels. Each can in each one, uncollecting all all the bananas on the level. But they can also defeat enemy. That they also will defeat enemies. Enemies and those enemies will allow them to unlock power ups. Power ups in in, in rooms in between levels. Levels that allow them to make smoothies to power up their smoothie gun. On. On. We we designed the game to help identify I, the core or um, the core attributes identified I of grit, pattern recognition, code of coachability, and learning agility, ability, ability through recording events within the game. When an enemy dies, when a, what type of smoothie is created, needed when a level is reset, and and similar events. And as a project manager. 
and Jeremiah, it was my job to organize as a more, more, more coherent vision of the game and to and to solve the minor issues that that happened happened while all the group was going on. There was there's I also found that I needed to needed to make decisions when there was disagreements between members of the group. Nope, this personally was a bit of an issue was a bit of was a bit of an issue issue as as I had not as I as it took me a while to to it took me a while to to figure out this this skill. Yeah, well. Um, Megan. Hi, my name is Megan uh, McCarthy, and I am the designer for our group, which means I was responsible for coming up with ideas and our the game could go, but it's like I mainly focused on creating all our dungeons and puzzles for the game, which I found pretty challenging pretty exciting because these puzzles had to test the desirable traits our client was looking for. I was also responsible for creating our scoring system within our game, along with our very own smoothie crafting room to create our very own buffs and coming up with creating the game mechanics of our game, such as the ambush aspect of one of our enemies, the blueberry vampire, and this mafia strawberry shooting at the player. <laughs> In the next slide you previously saw, I used tools to help me with this, such as Figma and Microsoft Word. And what I got out of this was learning to better communicate with our teammates, as well as not only coming up with the ideas, but planning them out, which to how they work, but you see is in this slide. As you can see, this is a rough draft of one of our levels, specifically level three. On top, you see the wall of levers, which when triggered, are do certain actions, such as opening certain gates and closing certain gates. You see two mafia strawberries and our banana object to open the exit. What you can see here is a screenshot of our actual level. As you can see, there's no jail cells, but beautiful blocks of ice that act as our game walls. And, and then what you also see is actual enemies within the hallway and the player going up to the wild weavers, which you can't see. What I like about this is it allows for some creative use of the, of the players for the player to do, such as opening a certain wall to have the mafia strawberry to kill our coffee zombie. Gabe. Hello, um, my name is Gabriel Hensley, and I am responsible for the art design of the game. Uh, art design is a broad term, so I'll uh, go into what I did specifically. My first task was to decide on an art style and then design the characters based on our outline. Uh, we decided to go with a cartoon-like style. I designed several other enemies, but due to time constraints, uh, they didn't end up being used. Uh, I also created the heads-up display, that is uh, the panel around the screen that shows all the information to the player that the player needs to know. Uh, I created visual diagrams for level layouts, and uh, chose pre-made assets to to use uh, for the game. Uh, most of the assets we used are were free, except for the level tile set. Uh, anything else was made by me by hand or composited together from existing assets. Uh, I used a combination of Clip Studio and Photoshop to do this. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
Uh, we decided to use uh, frame by frame animation for the players and enemies. This means that uh, each pose is drawn individually, then uh, played in sequence to create each animation, much like old Disney films. Uh, here we have the finished asset for the player, which consists of 12 separate drawings on an image or sprite sheet, as it's called, uh, that's then imported to Unity. After that, I link up each sequence with uh, the Unity animator and work with our uh, programmer to implement them into the game. Uh, in some cases, I would provide diagrams to Jason that illustrate how uh, the enemy should move and behave. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, I think uh, think Jason is next. I'll go ahead and pass it to him. Um, my name is Jason Friedman, and I was the programmer for this project. Basically, I was responsible for creating the code that allows the game to function. Th that allows the game to function. Things like things like the things like the enemy movement, the the enemy attack the enemy attack being able to transition to levels, uh, things like that. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we did have data tracking in the game and it, and it used a combination of CSV files and player prefs to record, to record data, such as number of shots per level, amount of damage taken per level, and, to and the total time taken for each level. And the data tracking works in a build of, or in one, in a build of the game, but it causes errors in the web-based version. So for the web-based version, the code for the data tracking was commented out. Hi everyone, I'm Jeremy Smith, and I was the tester for the game we made called Fruits of Labor. And I was responsible for testing the game by playing it and looking for bugs. I first wrote bug reports on Jira. I also used quality assurance to check that the exit criteria were met, and if they weren't, then I would make suggestions in the comment box about how to improve the game. I even checked the sketches of the levels, objects, and characters. I additionally examined the updated design documents, theme music, and sound effects to make sure there were no mistakes. What I gained from this experience is that I learned how to work in a group. I also saw how a video game was created and had practiced testing a video game. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to show you pictures of a couple of different bugs. In this picture, the player was trying to go from level one to level two in the game. To do this, he had to enter through the smoothie room where he would combine the fruits to make a smoothie buff. As you can see on the upper right, the, when the blue door was activated, it blocked the entrance to the smoothie room. This meant that the player couldn't advance to level two. Another bug I found was on level two. You can see it on the top left corner of the picture. When the door was activated, a blue square appeared in the entrance to the small snow filled room. However, it didn't prevent the player from entering the room. This bug was therefore less serious than the first one. And then, and I was going to play a demo of the game aim, aim as, a, as a demonstration. Um, I can put the, I can put the link to the game in the chat. All right, so you know, the game in in is um, the game uses uses um, uses a health system, and the enemies here take a more da uh, are able to take more damage damage and move around and 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 move around only a little. You know, um, here was the smoothie gener generation. Um, this would allow us to make a smoothie that would give us extra time. Um, with this, I would like to thank everyone who, everyone for helping me you know, along with this game, and and I would like to draw the draw the presentation to a close. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in uh, chat. Yep, we've got a question in chat, and that is the first question from Shauna Cohen, who. Uh, 
was one of the leaders of the Lunch and Learns that you guys enjoyed, right? Uh, Professor Cohen asks, um, which says first, thank you for sharing this creative game. Um, the question is, who is the intended audience for this game? Um, the intended audience would be people would be would be would be the candidates ass being assessed asked asked for or um, Mike's company company um, that we'd assume that would be um, early twenties to to thirties thirties in range range and the question on what on what inspired us to choose smoothies. Um, that was part of the base assignment. assignment and we and we kind of just ran with it. It was it was an interesting concept and we had a bit of and we had quite a bit of fun with it. Yeah, That's can, awesome. I was just oh, gonna sorry. say I can offer a little bit more insight on that. So um, the old coach Trent Simmons who is going to be working with Leanne at Northeastern actually came up with the idea originally um, and uh, we wanted it, I think at first it was, um, I think it was meant to be beer, but we wanted it to be a little bit more PC, so, uh, or PG, sorry. Um, so we decided to go with smoothies instead, and I felt like the idea worked out the same way. So, um, you know, combining flavors, whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's how we got to the idea. Um, yeah, if you had any more questions, please. Fantastic, yes, please, more questions for this group. Again, really, really wonderful playable game, um, except if you're not very good at video games like me and I had a hard time getting past the first guy. Um, <laughs> but, but that's testing my grit, right? Wonderful. Um, okay, good concept. So, so um, I don't know if you wanted to, to talk about exactly like how the gameplay related to some of those things. I mean, I could definitely see grit. Um, did, you wanna, did you wanna offer that before we move on? Um, there is a specific note out of pattern recognition that that I that I personally really like. Um, there, the the level with the, the level um, the level Megan showed code, code comes comes um, in a in a level where it's very easy for friendly fire to kill one of the enemies enemies and that and that is pretty well shown. And in the next level, there is an opportunity for there is an opportunity specifically for a player to lure and lure a zombie into into friendly fire again. And that would be and that that I thought thought of as pattern recognition, where the player here knows that the enemy can be hurt by by the enemy's attacks. Awesome. So if you recognize that you're you're gonna be more successful at that next level. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I love the way you've leveraged games for this unique purpose. Fantastic team. Well done. You can see in chat that you have a lot of, um, of uh, kudos from the community. Um, and I hope you uh, are, are uh, excited about this, what you've produced. Well done. Okay, on that note, I'm going to bring up the next team. So this team is Habitat Heroes with the client being Professor Jules Jaffe of SIO. I've also had the pleasure of working with Jules for a while. Um, and so this is uh, his second internship as well. Haven't scared him away either. <laughs> Wonderful to know. Uh, so so uh, Jules is really interested in making sure everyone knows the, about the dangers of climate change. And that is what this group is going to be talking about today. The coach, we are honored to have coach Rosalind Conrady, who is visiting us. She is now a graduate student in mechanical engineering, I believe, at Iowa State, if I'm getting that right. Recent grad in Mech E from SDSU. Thanks so much for joining us. She's new to us this year, but has been a fantastic coach for this team. So I will let you and the team take it away from here, Rosalind. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. All right. Um, before we get started, let me get that screen sharing going. Oops. Let me make sure I share the sound as well because we have a cool gameplay video made by one of our interns. Okay. So hello again, everyone. My name is Rosalind and I'm the coach for the climate change team and this is Habitat Heroes. And I would like to introduce uh, each of the interns one by one. So we have Angel Juarez, who is a tester. Then we have me. Next, we have Hannah Trong, 
She was the designer for the game. Then we have Elizabeth Sweeten, Lizzie for short. She served as project manager. Next, we have Jalen Banks. He's a programmer for the game. And we have Ruben Bitrago, who served as the artist. And I want to take a moment to thank the interns because I've learned so much from each and every one of them. And I'm really thankful for having the chance to be their coach as well. And it was a lot of fun working with you all. And in addition to our team, we have Iris Bricker, our mentor, and Dr. Jules Jaffe, our stakeholder and client. And I would also want to take a moment to say thank you to Aris for being an awesome mentor. They helped us so much with the, um, the process and they gave us so much help and insight for uh, the video game development process. And um, yes, that, that is Dr. Jules Jaffe. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you to him for giving us this opportunity to work on something really cool, impactful, and educational. All right, and I'll pass it on over to Lizzie. Oh, Lizzie, you're muted. Habitat buddy. Heroes is a game about implementing renewable energy sources to prevent global warming and protect animal habitats. The target demographic of the game is elementary school students. Cece, our player, joined the Habitat Heroes project led by Dr. Lopez. They're on a mission of protecting animal habitats by finding renewable energy sources that have been stolen by Megacore, a business that operates on non-renewable energy. On the first mission, CC drove the electric car in Antarctica to detect renewable energy, represented as blue dots, and non-renewable energy, represented as red dots. However, their mission became more difficult when Megacorp was on the verge of bankruptcy due to the impact of climate change. Mr. Megacore decided to switch the tires on CC's car so that they have to identify renewable and non-renewable energy icons rather than blue and red dots. As CC successfully mitigated climate change and saved all seven animals, Mr. Megacore realized the positive impact of renewable energy for his business and decided to rebrand his company as Greencore. He donated a large sum of money to Habitat Heroes to support the implementation of renewable energy for the public. And next we have some gameplay video that was recorded by our artist, Ruben Wittrago. My name is Ruben Bitrago, and I'm going to show you all our game that we've made for our project. This is a climate change promotion, climate change awareness, and it's featured species of animals. Um, there's one animal for each continent that are being endangered solely because of climate change. Um, so let's jump right in. So now we're in Antarctica, and you're going to want to save the species of the penguin, which are native here. Here in this level, you'll want to click on the blue dots. You want to ignore the red and the purple, because those are non-renewable. The blue ones show renewable sources. So you have here solar, and you have here water, so water-friendly, water-saving resources. And this is electrical. And ta-da, you did it. Now on to the next level. Here, you're going to have to select the actual icons themselves. So you're going to have to know which is which. And you got to choose wisely. You cannot choose these. Because this is coal, and this is exactly what we're trying to avoid. You notice that you have to do it very timely. Because then the this gets lower. So you're going to have to select as fast as you can to save the panda and this species. All right? And once you get them all done, it's all filled up and you go to the next level. Same thing. 
you fill this up. You fill it up as fast as you can. You ignore these. This is water pollution. This is coal once again. Solar, yes, we want that. Ignore that. That's greenhouse gas cause right there. You're going to want more electrical, geothermal. Just You just got to wait for, there you go. And boom. And again, these are all animals that are native to each continent. So here in North America, we're featuring the red wolf. So you're going to want to save the red wolf by clicking as many renewable sources as you can find in a timely manner. And just like that, we're finished. Um, hope you guys get a good glimpse of what the game is like and hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Ruben. All right, hey, Ruben. And next, the interns will uh, talk about what they did on the project. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah. As a designer, I designed the game mechanics, wrote a story for the game, drew all the art showing the story of the game, as well as emblem to the story are the main menu and the hint button. As a project manager, I helped out wherever I was needed. So I kept Jules updated on the team's progress, helped with concept art for the storyboard, researched species, found icons and art assets, and helped with the story of the game and coordinating that with the art. Uh, as a programmer, I was uh, very into uh, the, uh, the implementation during the game. Uh, so I helped out. Uh, Help up in the implementing the um, the UI aspects in the game. I uh, I spent a lot of time on the system mechanics in the game, and I also help help implement the the, the gameplay elements. And, uh, hello, yeah, I'm Ruben Butrago, and I'm the artist for the game. I've worked solely on concept art, and I made sure our color palette for our art is accessible. I created the maps for the continents and helped design some UI, UI ideas, as well as drew backgrounds for the instructions and credits pages. Hello, I am Angel Juarez. I researched the species as well as help with the concept art and storyboarding. I also found icons and art assets. I helped with implementing stuff into the game and tested the features as they were implemented. And as coach, I help program and implement the sticker book feature. And I also help everyone on the team thrive as a group and within their individual roles. And I had the opportunity to work alongside the wonderful Pong program staff. Now Lizzie will talk about the difficulties and successes that we had as a team. Some of the difficulties that we faced as a team were the short amount of time that we had to complete this project. We had more ideas to implement into our game, but we did not have enough time to add everything. Also, our networking, we could have used our opportunity of this internship to network with other teams. Also, our prioritization, we spent a lot of time perfecting our concepts and we did not give Jalen enough time to get them implemented into the game. And also the visual appeal of our game was a little bit lacking and we could have made our game a lot more visually appealing by animating our sprites if we'd had more time. Some of our strengths as a group were our flexibility. We were able to adapt to our time constraints and adjust our game concept to be finished in time and our collaboration. We worked very well together to accomplish tasks and coordinate what everyone needed to do. Our communication was also very good as a team. We collaborated together very well as a team and we were able to successfully communicate our ideas. 
Our team was also very efficient. We finished our tasks efficiently and we were often ahead of schedule. So we also made decisions efficiently as a group using polls. Thank you, everyone. You Fantastic. Yes, thank you. It was wonderful. We have, um, uh, so first of all, I wanted to say that I have seen firsthand the um, excellent communication and team vibe happening in Discord because these guys get extra props for like, you know, yeah, uh, the use of polls, but also like, you know, uh, high fiving each other virtually, adding gifs, uh, gifs to to make make a you know make a point that they just they just had it all down. Um, so so this was a wonderful thing to see the community that developed inside of eight weeks and a product um, that was really cool and involved research. So let me just uh, uh, draw some attention because some of these questions were answered. So Ara asked, "What was the was the research needed?" to be done for which your, your um, which animals you guys wanted to pick for each continent and Ruben said yes and um, uh, Hannah followed up by saying that um, they conducted secondary research and they ran it by Dr. Jules Jaffe for a fact check and in the game Dr. Lopez explained how each animal was impacted by climate change awesome Megan uh, McCarthy was asking one of our other interns so who is the target audience who are you aiming for and Elizabeth answered that it's uh, elementary school students particularly targeting kids here when them to learn about this um Sherry Sai has a question for all of you that's going to take a little bit more thinking so is there a way to get the game um in the game to get more time on the clock for doing something i am interested in your thoughts on some game mechanics and i can connect you guys with sherry directly if you'd like the clock um seems for some the clock for some seems exciting so 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 maybe there's something like really neat about the clock that you could use to to give them more time or less time what are your thoughts on that team uh, so in the final build of the game, I kind of like modified the points to like you can gain more points and you can earn less points uh, as you progress through the level. Uh, the time the timer is not like the same for every level. Uh, each level you get you gain less time. However, your game you can gain more points or less point and and gain less points. So it kind of so not every not every level is the is the same. But in terms of like gaining more points by like clicking on the uh, non renewable icon, uh, or not non renewable, uh, renewable icons uh, and gaining less points for non renewable icons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to call out something because, uh, you know, we're, we're getting getting some some comments here in chat. And um, there have been a number of teams that really specifically called out how they use active listening in order to be good team members and to support each other. And that was actually something that was emphasized in the Lunch and Learns led by um, Professor Shauna Cohen and Professor Sasha Zadek. Um, and that this was actually, you know, you know, so presented, taken in, implemented to make for better work. I mean, I, I can't come up with a better example of how well the, the interns have really absorbed, like, it, everything that that was given to them to really deliver um, an, an awesome product in each case. So I'm super excited by what they're sharing with you here today. So Angel was was just again following up on that that cool question from Sherry. Um, you know, there was a way to gain more time from the use of the purple dot in a little mini game, but they just didn't. You know, there's so many ideas that don't get into the final games, but um, they're there and they're ready to be picked up. So, um, and, and Juan Leon is noting that there's some people from NFAR Tech. We're going to talk about NFAR Tech at the end here. And yes, uh, all of the participants deserve congrats. Well done, team. Great job. Um, and let us now move to the last group, uh, last but absolutely not least, the Calm Seas group, um, which has another returning Clients, this is uh, my, my colleague at the Qualcomm Institute Research Scientist, Dominique Rizzolo. Um, Dominique has the, the really amazing job of being a, uh, an archaeologist who specializes in underwater um, work, uh, recovery of underwater sites, and digitizing them. And so he, he's skilled in the digital arts, the, the tech, and as, as well as being a, di a scientific diver, which is a crazy thing, and an archaeologist. So Dominique is back again, um, and this year is bringing a cool project about a shipwreck 
that the, the team gets to put into a game and tell a story about. And so here we have our coach, um, who is also returning coach, Corley Huang, uh, here from Pong. And I'm sad that this is probably going to be Corley's last year as a coach because she has graduated, yay, and is moving on, get, getting a job out there in the world. And uh, she is going to introduce her team and take it away from here. Okay, just double checking that we had everyone. All right. So, good afternoon, y'all. Yeah, some really awesome work that we've seen so far. Thank you all for sticking with us until the very end. My name is Coralie, and I'm the coach for Team ComSees and their project, Discover Marie Celestia. These past eight weeks have certainly not been easy for the interns as many of them were thrusted into their roles to develop this project from picking up new programs to working together to accomplishing this amazing feat. They've all risen to the occasion to create something undoubtedly worthy of celebration and I'm just so proud of them for kicking butt. Before I hand over this presentation to them, however, we just wanted to first start with acknowledgement, acknowledgements where they're due. So. A big thank you to our stakeholder, Dominique Rosolo from the Cultural Heritage Engineering Institute for providing us with guidance and feedback, as well as James P. Delgado, Scott Blair, Falco Cluster, Eric Lowe, Viv Petrovic, Jean-Pierre Roja, Philippe Roja, and the government of Bermuda, as well as all the institutes above that have pro provided us with the research materials that made this project possible. And of course, we can't forget our awesome mentor, Scott Lagrasta at Ubisoft, who provide us advice, guidance, and technical help to our interns as well. Thanks, Scott. And without further ado, let's let Team ComSees introduce themselves. Ashwin, if you'd like to start us off. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashwin. I am the programmer for Team ComSees. I was in charge of adding the main functionality to the game. This includes making the gameplay and controlling the menu navigation. All of this was done using the programming language C Sharp. Uh, I will now pass it over to Garrett. Hello everyone, my name is Garrett and I'm the project manager in this team. I was in charge of planning and created general tickets for every member in this team in order to meet criteria from our clients. I also had a sub role as an artist to create 2D pictures and a 3D environment for this game. Now I'm going to pass it the introduction to our artist, Logan. <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Logan Wright and I'm the artist for Team Calm Seas. My duties were to use MeshLab and Blender to design 3D models for the game and apply texture to them as well as create 2D art assets using Krita. Now on to our designer, Lawson. Thank you very much, Logan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lawson Pritchard. I'm the game designer for Team Calm Seas. I created game concepts and mechanics, researched historical sources to create art assets and flavor text, and created and executed presentations to our client. I'm now going to pass the mic off to Nassim. Hi, I'm Nassim. I, uh, as a game tester, I, um... For this team, I provided feedback by play testing, um, completed build of the game, and as a sub role, I assisted the programmer. So I helped Ashwin work on side uh, side tasks. Um, and next is uh, Lawson is going to tell you about the game premise and storyboard. Thank you very much, Nassim. The basic game premise is that Mary Celestia is a first-person aquatic exploration game. We explore a civil war shipwreck off the coast of Bermuda. It was designed to be an educational tool for middle to high school age children. And here's a brief explanation of the history of the Mary Celestia. Essentially, during the 1860s, uh, the, the so many southern states seceded from the United States to create the Confederate States of America. And the United States responded by, with military action, but importantly for our story, a blockade, um, a network of ships that would block trade in and out of the Confederacy. And these small agile ships were designed to evade or run the blockade. 
uh, were called blockade runners. And the Mary Celestia was one such blockade runner running a route between Bermuda and Wilmington, North Carolina. It ran that route for four months before it crashed off the shore of Bermuda. And it was salvaged immediately. And then again in 1960, 1983, and 2011. And the basic storyboard of the game is that you are um, you're tasked to dive into this wreck. And as you approach the site, you navigate through the water in first person using the W and S keys to move forward and backwards and the arrow keys to move left and right. And once you're at the shipwreck, you'll swim around and take pictures of the artifacts within by clicking on them. Now let's pass the mic to Ashvin and Nassim to talk about the programming process. First, I'll talk about how I programmed the gameplay. I had never created a underwater gameplay before, so first I had to figure out how to do that. I decided to imagine that the player would be traveling in outer space where there was no gravity and coded accordingly. Once that was done, I had to add input from the player to make it so that the actions would only happen when the right key was pressed. The, last, the next part was a photo album. We had all the objects placed on the scene, so next we needed a way to record all of them. I had to make a camera system that would record any object the player clicked on and save it in the photo album in the pause menu. Once, uh, once all the items were found, the player would win. We also added in a timer to show how much oxygen the player had left. If the player was unable to find all of the objects before the timer reached zero, the player would lose. And last is the menu navigation. Once we decided what the menu should look like, my job was to, was to connect them all together and make sure the right button goes into the right place. Next, Nassim will, will talk about the testing. Yeah, so for testing, um, after Ashton implemented new features, I would uh, test them and give my feedback. And I also coordinated with other team, uh, other team members to ensure the gameplay was in line with the with design philosophy. And um, after testing, uh, I would create executable builds for us to use. Um, and also uh, to assist the programmer, um, I worked on related tasks like creating the start menu uh, implementing looping ambient music and um, sound effects for the buttons. All right, thank you very much, Ashton and Nassim, for your insights. Let's pass the Mac. Let's pass the Mac. Let's pass the mic to Garrett and Logan uh, to talk about the process of creating the assets. <clears throat> My duties as the artist was to design the scenery and objects that would be used for the game. First, I had to learn about photogrammetry, obtaining an object's or environment's phys physical information through recording and measuring from some photographic imagery and how to use MeshLab and Blender. I began my work by applying texture to two 3D environment pieces, the Mary Celestia and the Mary Bow in MeshLab. Then, I started creating 3D artifacts, such as shoes, bottles, coal, boxes, and an iron pan based on, on the designer's list in Blender to be used in the game. I eventually applied texture to a few of those artifacts. After that, I took screenshots of the artifacts against 2D backgrounds, as you uh, see in the slides. And, and lastly, I was given the task to create 2D art assets like flipper speed percentage and oxygen tank time and Krita to be used in the game. And now, on to our project manager, Garrett. My major work as an artist was to set up the environment from the plan board. During this process, I needed to create and import a skybox of underwater things. But having a few simple models such as ocean floor is not enough, we wanted the environment to be more real. Therefore, I set a post-processing effect to make the whole environment more blue and look like the ocean. 
The rising terrain is based on the picture taken from our client, since the ocean floor is not completely flat. If you look up as a player, you can also see the water shatter as well. After Logan's work on cleaning cloud points of the ship, I imported and made it more suited to the sand floor and the terrain. Another part of the artistic world was to create the 2D pictures, specifically to create the icon and logo images for the website of each IO. The icon image background is our ship with our game's name of Discover Mary Celestia. The logo is composed of two parts, the ship whale and the island of Bermuda, since it's where the story begins. That's all the work I've done, and I would like to pass it back to Lawson. Thank you very much, uh, Garen Logan, for your insights. Now we're going to discuss the challenges uh, that we encountered with the project, starting with Ashwin talking about our difficulties with GitHub. A lot of us weren't used to working with GitHub, and this led to a lot of problems down the line during the project. When merging different changes together, we would keep running into conflicts that we needed to resolve. I had some prior experience working with GitHub and I was able to help with that. And now Lawson will talk about the issues with the scope. Uh, as anyone knows, or as anyone who has worked with a uh, project on a limited time scale knows, scope is a huge issue uh, where there's a lot of things that like, if you just had more time, you could implement it. And there's a lot of features that we had to, we're unfortunately unable to implement uh, due to time constraints, such as a storm mechanic that every uh, every certain amount of dives, it would like restructure the environment and everything. But we just didn't have the time to, uh, to make use of that. Um, but now I'm going to pass it on to Garrett to talk about uh, his challenges in internship. So as a project manager, it was very hard for me at the beginning to handle artistic work because I had zero experience on it, especially on 3D modeling. As you can see in the picture, that's a setting for water shatter. There are tons of different factors, import and set, and the network between factors is very complicated. What I did to solve the problem was to watch the tutorials and follow step by step, and then to ask for help when it's necessary. Well, thank you very much for your, Garrett, for your perspective. And now we're gonna show off our demo of Discover Mary Celestia. If you guys are interested in following along, here is the QR code as well that will link to the download for our game, but we will also be showing a quick video demo. Let me know if you hear the sound. So here are the basic instructions uh, of the game uh, and the menu. As we go in, there is uh, we get some, some exposition, some, uh, some basic, basic background for someone who didn't see this presentation. And now we're in. We're swimming down, looking for artifacts with an empty photo roll. And as we swim down, we find our first artifact, the dark boot, which uh, footwear and footwear creation devices were actually really, really valuable to the Confederacy as they severely lacked any industrial capacity. And here we see it in our photo album. We can check it out. Um, and as we swim, we find another another artifact, our Florida water cologne, which you can actually buy today. Um, it's actually pretty easy to acquire um, if you want to smell smell like history. Um, and now, as we continue, we find a box of um, organic silt, which used to be a uh, hay used to cushion bottles of wine. Um, as we move further, we find a box full of sand silicate, if you're fancy. And uh, we continue exploring the rack, finding different uh, artifacts hidden amongst the, the ruin, like a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc, which is a nice white wine from citrusy uh, aftertastes. And as we continue to navigate through the rack, we find uh, the brass hinge, which used to connect the door. Um, most um, most organic material, most wood or anything else is not preserved. This wooden plank here is a uh, very remarkable in the fact that it survived. Most 
wood uh, being underwater for that long essentially just turns into mold. Uh, and here, you, the last artifact is our clean burning coal, a piece of anthracite coal, which burns smokeless to allow the Mary Celestia to run the Union blockade stealthily. And here is our complete dive. Thank you all for watching. Thanks, Lawson. And thank you all for your attention as well. This actually concludes Team ComC's presentation. And I'm actually going to hand the mic back to Leanne to open up the floor for any questions or any comments at all. Thank you. Fantastic, team. You know, once again, what a wonderful example of the power of collaboration across disciplines, like not only across skills team, but, you know, there were some comments that you may not have seen because they weren't necessarily to everyone, like, like the realistic graphics. This is from data. This is from data actually acquired 3D point cloud data underneath the sea in Bermuda of, of the shipwreck itself, right? And that is represented in the game. That is why there was so much work done in Blender and Unity to pull it into. Yes. Um, fantastic. So let me get to the questions because there are several of them. Ara, um, are the artifacts based on real items that can be found on the Mary Celestia? Yes. Um, they right. are they're artistic representations of them because <laughs> most of them look really, really have deteriorated a lot because they've been underwater for 150 years. So Logan, Logan did a great job making these artifacts look nice. Um, they would not look quite that nice, kind of like in a historical movie where there's like the, the actor who played the historical figure and then the actual like figure of them. Um, to ask to answer uh, Pamela Cosman's question about replayability, uh, initially in early design phases, um, this was much more of a roguelike kind of game where you had a very limited portion of time to dive in, kind of look around, and then kind of strategize between different runs as you like found different artifacts and uh, kind of upgraded your capacity over time and then the storm mechanic and everything. But with the scope that we ended up having, with the time we had, we just didn't have enough time to, to include those uh, those roguelike mechanics. Um, and I believe that's all the questions I've seen in the chat. Um, that's wonderful. I guess I would note that that much like the group that Dominique hosted last year and, and actually Corley was also the coach for, um, this can continue, right? This is wonderful work and, it, and it's representing for the public you know, actual data that's that's um, being recovered, and so this might might continue uh, with with members of this group, uh, uh, other others. There were students at UCSD who actually worked on the Discover Hoyo Negro project uh, last year. So, fantastic. Okay, so Chris Welter is asking, how do you control the player head? Is it mouse arrow keys? What? Um, as Ashran had pointed out, I was technically incorrect slightly with the with pointing out how to control the uh, the player's head. Generally speaking, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ashvin or Nassim could probably uh, uh, clear that up. I think it's with like the other arrow keys looking the other ways, but um, feel free to no. clear it up. So actually, so, f so, so, f so f for the controls, I decided to give the player two options. They can either use W and S to move up and down or they can use the up and down arrow keys instead, and to actually and to actually to, to and to actually turn the player around, the the player just needs to move the mouse to the side of the screen, and then the camera will turn automatically. Excellent, thank you, Ashwin. Okay, yes, and Aura is commenting from a UX perspective, great idea to give players two options. We've really been trying to think about universal design, which is a tall order, given there's only eight weeks and we have to make something from scratch anyway. Um, so yes, great. And Chris saying you use the, the mouse as a transform, smart. Wonderful. You're seeing that these teams collaborated together. We had channels for each of the roles um, and they were actually chatting in there. And then there's also on the side, which we didn't talk about, but it's also wonderful. They created their own channels. They were playing games. They were chatting about things that interest them. So this was a really wonderful opportunity for all of our groups, not just to dive into their own team, but to, to collaborate with each other on, on things that are interesting to them. So great. Okay, any other questions from the group before uh, we...
uh, wrap up, I have a bunch of people to thank and some some message for the community as we look to develop this effort further. Uh, <laughs> calm winds and following seas. Corley, we will miss you. Yes, yes, from, from Dominique, our client, yes. Wonderful, okay, great job team. And great job to all of the teams. I mean, wow, what a wonderful effort. We are so excited that you were able to share what you presented, what you, what you have worked on so hard for the last eight weeks. And this is this effort really, I think, speaks to the fact that we are missing out um, as a community by not, um, not sharing our teams, our, our, our community, neurodiverse communities work, right? This is, this is something that we really have to figure out how to get better with, right? So I am trying to share with you and hopefully you can see it right now. I'm sharing a screen to talk about different programs that support neurodiverse work. We're focused on games here, um, but if, if you were able to join us at the very beginning, you heard that Ubisoft is helping us as a partner, a global partner. They're such a huge organization, tens of thousands or at least 10,000 people working for them and it's really remarkable. Um, and so we need more partners like that. There are different groups at universities and elsewhere around the country who are trying to create and including um, uh, to others here in San Diego, trying to create more opportunities to take advantage of the fantastic talents of our neurodiverse community. Um, we need more of this. And what we'd really like to see is not just this, but really a community of practice supporting neurodivergent workers that, that is not just local to each um, small area, but something that's global. And I'm highlighting here, not just the work of all of these groups that um, you know, have, 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 uh, are somewhat well-known in the community, but two others that are new, I'm, as, as called out early on, I'm moving to Northeastern and moving some of my team to Northeastern um, and we'll be collaborating with Pong. So there should be an arrow going back and forth here. But I also wanna call out a, an awesome new collaboration that one of our, interns, Colin Caulfield, um, created. He, he's a networker extraordinaire, and he introduced us to Justin Nahama um, and Jessica Taverniti, who are starting the Spectrum Care Alliance here in San Diego and are really well aligned with trying to identify the superpowers of our, our kids, teens, young adults in this community um, so that we can really better support them. And with that, I encourage you to be involved in what we're doing here. Um, I'm going to take off this, this share, if I can figure that out. Let's pause the share. There we go. Um, and I want to ask both Ara Jung and Sarah Hacker to, to, to come on screen and unmute themselves because, you know, the interns may or may not know who I am. <laughs> I show up from things here and there. When things get really rocky, I, I, I manage stuff. But these gals have been doing the day-to-day, -day, setting everything up. Day so Ara was a coach, but she was also an organizer of the program. She managed the initial applications. Um, it, fr from soup to nuts, Ara did this single-handedly last year. Sarah did this in 2018 when we were in person, but is now back from maternity leave. So we had both of them this year creating this fantastic opportunity, which allowed us to expand, which allowed us to give us some bandwidth to bring in Ubisoft as mentors and really make sure that they felt supported in what they were doing and, and that our interns really benefited and didn't feel overwhelmed by what was going on. Um, and so I just wanted to give a massive shout out to Sarah and Ara Sarah is staying here at Pong. Ara is coming with me to Northeastern. So we're going to keep doing more of the same, but we're going to expand to Boston. Ooh. All right. So I don't know if you guys wanted to say anything from your perspective, but I have a bunch more thank yous. Just really quick, um, I, I want to give as much credit as possible to Ara. Um, this last year was the first year that we um, received the NSF funding, and we really had the resources that we needed to provide um, all of the um, software and the tools and the structure. Um, and I was gone and she handled it all. And she set up such an amazing system that this year when I stepped back in and, it, to help, it was all running so smoothly and so nice um, that I got to do something that 
is sometimes hard, which is um, really connecting one-on-one -on -one with a lot of the interns, connecting with specific groups, being able to jump in and help um, here and there, but she had it all set up and it was amazing. And so Ara deserves the credit for making this whole thing go. And she's also set it up um, for me to run next year when, when she leaves us here. And so I, I've, I've really appreciated her help and, and the opportunity this year to be a part of it. Doing it um, remotely is, uh, is different and it's a little bit harder on us um, to do just we like seeing people and we like doing all of these things together, um, but it's it's really been an amazing experience. And as a staff member, as somebody who um, has been doing this the last several years, um, we, I have to say that we learn a ton from our interns and we learn a ton through the process as well. I really always appreciate the lunch and learns from Shauna. I learn something new every time. Um, and the projects are always amazing. And so um, again, I love this program. Um, my heart is in it always, and thanks to Ara for sh shuttling it through the last, this year and last year, um, it's just been really amazing. You know, Sarah said that I made a system, but I actually copied what Sarah had done the year before and made it into a remote system, so it sort of all came in full circle, so I just want to say thank you, Sarah, for being the first one to really set it up and have a good system that I could uh, you know, use as reference to make this happen remotely. And I also want to give a quick shout out to, uh, you know, Leanne for actually, you know, having us be able to have this program for sure. So just want to say thank you to you and everyone that's involved in the future of work for sure. But I'm sure you'll get to that. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, but please back me up. You know, you know, you know there's a lot of hands that makes this work. Um, I, I thank you, thank you both. I do want to give a shout out. We already talked about a lot of the investigators involved. My co-PI Pam Cosman, um, Suja Day, both in engineering. We've got um, Shauna Cohen and Sasha Zadak, who are doing the the lunch and learns as well as studying what kinds of supports our interns might need in order to be more effective and get into into jobs. Um, and then we have Craig Callender, who's working closely with an awesome student, Jada Wilton Little, who is a graduate student and, and is looking at really what is the spectrum of the ethics situation out there right now. There are a lot of things being asked of new employees that um, are kind of um, sort of violating some privacy concerns. And so that, that's their first attempt to sort of examine what the ethical landscape is looking like here so we can better support getting um, neurodivergent workers in jobs um, of which they will rock. So um, I wanted to then say that this, this, we don't necessarily learn from what we've done well unless we have a good evaluation of how everything went. And so we get to privately ask the interns, what did they think? What did they like? Where, where, what could we have done better? And so that is led by, that effort is led by a team at UC San Diego that does evaluation specifically, and that's Georgia Kovacs and Monica Gao. And so we're really grateful for their talents and efforts to keep going out to the interns. Also, if there's family on here, you probably got an, an internship survey too, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for your help and participation. There have been graduate students as well that have been involved, not just uh, Jada that I mentioned in the in the ethics, but we have graduate students working together again across disciplines because we've got two engineering graduate students in ECE owner to Pencilic, and we've got uh, Saigon Aratan, who's, who are both working on um, technology to try to help as we wait for the world to catch up and for the world to recognize that our interns are ready to go and ready for their for your workplace, we're also trying to help support interns to um, learn to sort of um, orient in ways and um, you know give feedback in ways that the neurotypical world is expecting. And so they're creating tech that you could use privately that you can get some sort of feedback and help you know, improve as you have seen the feedback that's given at Lunch and Learns, the feedback that's given in coaching um, has been used to drive really fantastic work, excellent progress. So that's exactly what those students are developing in combination with Trent Simmons, who has been working together. Um, he's actually coming with us as well as uh, Sagan, uh, sorry, excuse me, Sundar Ringarajan to um, San Diego, or sorry, to Northeastern from San Diego. They're both graduate students. 
um, sort of in the the, the more uh, communication uh, sciences program, and they are they are working together to to do right now collect data on a VR interview project, right? So how can we get um, our interns learning about interview skills through virtual reality, and how can we get some information about back channeling, like, mm -hmm, yeah, uh -huh, so that we know that people are following along and give them feedback about those things. So that's an active project right now. Again, we don't get to do the cool work we've done without the support from the community. We have support from the National Science Foundation. We're extremely grateful for that support. Um, it allows us to um, have great programs like this, but we're not really successful unless the larger community comes together and hires our good folks. I mean, come on, right? So we have some of our interns have succeeded and gotten jobs and we're just really gonna continue in that effort. I put a link in chat right here um, to show the, who everyone is who's working on the teams. A large number of a high percentage of our interns are actually job seeking right now. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my information is on that website, um, back, back, just back up from the internship bit, and you'll find me, you can find Sarah, you can find Ara, um, you can find my co-director, Joe Snyder, who's been involved here, and all the other great people at Pong who've been, who've been helping here. Be happy to tell you about the strengths of our interns, and yes, thank you, Ara. You can also click on their, their individual profiles on LinkedIn um, next to their names. So um, we really need this community of practice to come together to better support our interns as they develop their skills, but also giving them that really important first tech job. Um, this is the good work that a number of us are doing here in San Diego, and we wanna connect with other people who are doing it around the country and around the world. So, and with that, I leave you to think about this mission and see what you can do to help. Thank you very much for being involved today. Congratulations again to our fantastic interns for a job very well done. And with that, I leave you.